what I'm going to tell you about is uh, the design of proteins um, that carry out uh, uh, new and useful functions. Uh, so essentially all the important processes of life are mediated by protein molecules and these protein molecules evolved in response to all the challenges uh, that um, were faced during the evolution of humans and the evolution of all organisms. And the more you understand about biology, the more you realize how amazingly well uh, proteins, the proteins that exist in nature, uh, solve these problems. Um, but today, we face new problems. And um, uh, you know, we're heating up the planet. There's new viruses, new diseases. Uh, we're running out of fuel. And uh, if one, and again, appreciating how wonderfully the proteins that exist in nature uh, solve the problems that arose during evolution, one can have confidence that in about uh, you know, several billion years, we would have new proteins that would solve modern day problems as well as our naturally occurring proteins solved uh, the problems that were faced during evolution. But of course, most of us don't want to wait three billion years for, um, for problems to get solved. And so uh, that's the idea of protein design. We're trying to develop methods for designing new proteins that solve current day problems, as well as the proteins in our bodies and the bodies of other living things solve the problems that uh, arose during evolution. So uh, first, I need to tell you what proteins are before I tell you what pro how we design them. Uh, so as I said, uh, proteins mediate the critical processes of life. Proteins are made out of amino acids. There's 20 different types of amino acids. And each protein has a unique sequence of amino acids. So um, a protein might ha typically would have about 100 amino acids, and they'd be strung together in a linear sequence. So uh, it'd be like one long 200 or uh, 100 uh, letter word. Um, so each protein has a unique structure that's essential for carrying out its function. And here I just show pictures of different protein structures that carry out uh, different functions in our bodies. Um, the, I told you that each protein has a unique amino acid sequence, and so you can represent these sequences kind of like beads on a string like this. So they have names, the, the names of the different protein, different amino acids are indicated here. Probably if you go to a health food store, they'll try and convince you to buy a jar of one or a variety of these, but it won't do you any good because you eat proteins every day anyway. Um, and uh, so, um, uh, uh, so each, um, each protein has a unique sequence of amino acids. Um, actually, in this picture, the same amino acid has the same color. So you can imagine 20 different colors or 20 different, they're basically, they're 20 different types, and they're just strung together in a linear sequence like this. Um, so you can imagine how is it hard for, um, how does a, a particular sequence like this do anything useful? And it's because, as I said, it folds up to a three-dimensional structure like this, and the, um, the interesting thing is that each different amino acid sequence folds up to a different three-dimensional structure. It's not obvious, however, how the sequence of amino acids uh, determines the three-dimensional structure. So that, um, that, that problem of predicting how the amino acid sequence of a protein determines what its three-dimensional structure is is called the protein structure prediction problem. And that's a problem that, um, that I worked on when, um, and my group worked on when, um, uh, when um, I first came to the University of Washington. So, uh, but there's another way of looking at this problem. And we can, um, and I guess maybe I'll just go to the next slide to illustrate it here. Uh, so, where do, pro where do amino acid sequences come from? Well, you all know that we have, that we have genomes. We're in a genome sciences department, and in each of our cells, we have a genome. A genome is made out of genes. There are about 30,000 genes in our, in our bodies. Um, and each gene, genes are made out of DNA. You've heard of DNA. Um, and each gene encodes a particular sequence of amino acids. Um, and uh, that sequence of amino acids, as I just told you, will then fold up into a three-dimensional structure like this one. And so this is essentially all of biology is on this slide. We have DNA genes giving rise, encoding amino acid sequences. The amino acid sequences then fold up to proteins, and the proteins then go and do all the mediate um, all the important processes of life, like I said. Um, so um, as you're hopefully thinking, listening to me, uh, there are ions passing through proteins in your brain that are, that are 
producing currents that are giving rise to your thoughts. If you ate before, there's proteins in your stomach that are breaking down the proteins in the food that you ate. Um, and if you walked to get here, there was proteins in your muscles that um, got you here. Okay, so this is basically biology. We have genes going to amino acid sequences, going to protein structures and functions. But now let's think about, so, and, and this is called the central dogma of bio, molecular biology. The information goes this way. Uh, but now, um, if we understood how to go from DNA to amino acid sequence to proteins, you could imagine running this process in reverse. And I'll illustrate that now with this protein here. This protein turns out to not be a very nice protein. It's the protein that's on the surface of the flu virus, uh, on the, of the influenza virus. And so there's, you know, there's flu strains, every, different flus every year. This actually happens to be the protein that's on the surface of um, the uh, 1918 uh, pandemic influenza virus. Uh, but it turns out that all influenza viruses have a very similar protein on, on their surface. Okay, so this is not a good protein. But what if we understood how, we could, how to go backwards? Uh, then you could imagine um, designing a brand new protein that doesn't exist in nature, this little red thing here, and you could design it if you knew what you were doing in such a way that it would stick very, very tightly to this flu protein, and if it stuck tightly enough, it might prevent the flu virus from getting into our cells. So you start by with a computer model of this protein um, bound to, um, uh, well, the design process is, the design challenge is to design a protein that will block the flu virus from getting into cells. Uh, so, um, so once you've designed the protein on the computer, what do you do then? Well, now you go backwards. So you've designed this protein on the computer. And I'll tell you in a moment how, or outline how we do that. And now you have to go backwards to the amino acid sequence of the protein. Um, so we designed this protein so we can, in the process of designing it, we actually, what we, we did is we found an amino acid sequence which would fold up to it, which predicted to fold up to a structure that is predicted to block the flu virus. So um, in fact, after we build, um, Maybe I'll just say that again. After we come up with a computer model of the protein, of a protein that would block the flu, um, I'll actually show you an animation in just a moment that shows how we compute the sequence, a sequence which is predicted to fold up this way. Now, then we have an amino acid sequence. Uh, to go back to the DNA, that's called the genetic code, and that was worked out in the 60s. So once we have an amino acid sequence on the um, or once we have a protein structure on the computer, we can work out what amino acid sequence it would have. And then um, we can, uh, by using the genetic code, um, identify a DNA sequence which encodes this protein. Now, this is a brand new protein, so that DNA sequence doesn't exist in our genomes, but uh, it turns out that DNA is essentially a commodity item. There are many, many companies today who compete with each other to offer you more DNA at a lower price. Um, and so every month we look at all the different companies and see who's giving the best deal on DNA. And then we order lots and lots of synthetic genes, pieces of DNA that encode these made up proteins we've designed. So after we have the amino acid sequence, um, essentially I just did this the other day with proteins I'm designing. We take that amino acid sequence, we put it into an email and we send it to the company that's giving the best prices that, that, um, uh, that uh, day. And we can now do this for, um, it costs about uh, 50 cents per amino acid, so it's getting cheaper and cheaper. So now once we have the DNA, this artificial gene, it's not a gene in our genomes, but a gene that encodes this protein, uh, we put the gene into bacteria, and the bacteria make lots and lots of the protein, and then we uh, can get the, then we, uh, uh, after we've grown up the bacteria, we can uh, break them open and the protein pops out, and then we can see whether in fact blocks the flu, vi flu virus. And that's basically what we do for every problem I'm gonna tell you about today. Now, why is, um, you might think, well, there's, all, there's so many organisms in nature and you know, we have 30,000 proteins, there are, you know, there's, so, there's like millions of different organisms, what's the point of designing new sequences? Well, it's useful to consider the number of different amino proteins that could exist. So I told you there are 20 different amino acids. So at the first position, you could have every, any one of the 20. Then at the second position, you could have any one of the 20. And at the third position, you could have not any one of the 20. So the number of, uh, number of different protein sequences is 20 times 20 times 20 on 
to the number of amino acids in the protein. And proteins, as I told you, typically have um, 100 to 200 amino acids. So the number of amino acid sequences, which is the number of different proteins um, which are possible, is 20 times 20 times 20, 200 times, which Ella can tell you is a very big number. Um, so um, nature has only explored prob um, a tiny, tiny fraction of that. So maybe na nature has explored 10 to the 10th sequences at most, and the number of possible sequences is something like 10 to the 200th. So nature really hasn't gotten anywhere in exploring what's out there. And that's what, our, that's what we get to do. We get to, dis, we get to try and find things that don't exist and then make them and see what they do. Okay, so how do we actually do this? Um, so this is, this is what we do when we're designing proteins. We start with a computer calculation of a sequence which is predicted to fold up to, have, uh, to make a protein with a structure that we want or a function that we want, like blocking the flu virus. Um, as I said, once we've designed it, we know what the amino acid sequence is. We can use the genetic code to get the DNA sequence and make the gene, and then we make the protein and assay it. Okay, so now I'm gonna to explain to you a little bit about how we design the protein, design proteins. And the concept I have to explain is that um, the way that an amino acid sequence determines a three-dimensional structure is that the amino acids, the, the, the structure that the protein folds to is the lowest energy structure for that amino acid. So if this were a, if this were a bumpy surface and there was a ball rolling around on it, then um, this would be uh, the lowest elevation point. Um, but this is instead a protein. It's not rolling downhill literally, but it's going downhill in energy. And what that means for, for those of you who um, uh, know a little bit more about interactions between atoms is that um, the atoms in the protein are getting close to each other, their hydrogen bonds getting made, opposite charges are getting close to each other, and that's why the energy drops. So to design a protein, if we want it to fold up to this structure, we have to find a sequence such that this is the lowest energy structure, that, there, that this structure is lowest energy. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you a, in sort of an animation of a computer calculation where we say we wanna make a protein that has this shape and um, this is just showing where the backbone of the protein is. And these little squiggly things that are coming in and out, the little stick-like things, are different amino acids. So amino acids differ by having different, um, different what are called side chains coming out. And so when we're changing the sequence, we're just changing the, sequ the, um, the shape of the amino acids, the identity of the amino acid that comes off the backbone. And when we're doing this calculation, basically what the computer is doing is searching for the combination of amino acids uh, which give this structure the lowest energy. Okay, and so, um, but one thing you can see here is that uh, we kept, um, the, the protein was kept fixed. We didn't really change its overall shape at all. We just changed what the amino acids are. Um, so this will give us an amino acid sequence, which is very low in energy in the structure, but there might be some other completely different structure, which is lower in energy for that same sequence. So once we have that sequence, uh, we do a second calculation where we keep that sequence fixed, but now we search through, all through a very large number of possible conformations uh, for this sequence, different shapes of the protein, looking for what the lowest energy shape is for that sequence. And what we are looking for is sequences that have the property that when you search through all this very, very large space of possible conformations, the lowest energy one is the one that we want. And that's basically how we do protein design. So now, the rest of my talk, I'm going to give you examples. So the very simplest problem you might think of is, is sort of what I was outlined in that, those two movies. Can we simply make a sequence um, which uh, will fold up to a new structure that's not found in nature? Now, proteins in nature, because they evolved, are essentially all accidental. They have, the, each one has kind of idiosyncratic features because nature never really cared about elegance. Nature just wanted to get something that worked. So um, we decided to try to make uh, sort of minimalist, idealized proteins. Um, and uh, it's a little hard to explain that if you don't know a lot about protein structure. But let's just say they're represented by, by these schematics here. Now, we then uh, run that first movie to find an amino acid sequence as sequence, which is very low in energy in this structure or in this structure. And now we want to check that that amino acid sequence has no other structure which is still lower in energy. 
Now, it turns out this is a very big computer calculation because a protein chain is very flexible. There are many different possible conformations it could have. So a number of years ago, we started a project called Rosetta at Home where we, asked, where we enlisted volunteers all around the world, um, and we now have 350,000 um, volunteers. And um, if you get excited about what I'm talking about, maybe we'll have 350,050 by the time by tomorrow. Anyway, you just go to the website, you sign up your computer, and then um, what happens is, uh, in what happened in this case, these cases, for example, we take the sequence of this protein and we send it out to all the volunteers in the network, in the, all these 250,000 volunteers. And what they, what they do is they search, they run that second movie, they search, they, the, 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 the protein folds up on their computer, and uh, they send us back the lowest energy structure that they find. So this is the energy, and this is the distance from the, um, from the structure we were trying to make. So some people are unlucky, and the lowest energy structure they find, I should say each red dot is a different person's contribution. So you can see we have a lot of volunteers. Um, so some people end up pretty high in energy. This is energy on this axis. Remember, the search is trying to look for the lowest energy state. And when they're high in energy, they're often far away from what we were trying to make. But what you can see here is the people who got really low energy structures um, uh, also got quite close to the structure we were trying to make. So this sequence has the property that when you use 350,000 people's computers all around the world and try and predict what its structure is, the lowest energy structure they find is really close to, um, to what uh, we were trying to make. And so then, um, if we have a sequence that has that property, we then, as I said, we order a gene that encodes that protein, and then we make the protein in bacteria, and um, what we find when we do this is the proteins that we make are very, very stable. It's very hard to pull them apart, much harder than it is to pull apart naturally occurring proteins, because again, naturally prote occurring proteins didn't evolve to be optimal in any sense like that. And when we use experimental methods to determine the three-dimensional structure, we find that the proteins that we've designed are very, very similar to the, um, to the design models. So we can design brand new proteins um, that have exactly the structure that we want them to. On the other hand, this is kind of boring because these proteins don't do anything. They're very, very stable. So it's like we've designed new rocks new, <laughs> with, with very particular shapes. And we've gotten very good at designing rocks with, well, very small rocks made out of protein with very different shapes. And the project I'm working on is to make is um, making very long, skinny ones, and I won't tell you why I'm doing that. Because, um, okay, but now you're going to be more interested in proteins that can do stuff. Um, so uh, I, I mentioned earlier the flu virus, and this is a picture of what influenza virus looks like. Um, it's got these, these things on its surface are proteins that, um, that target the virus to, um, to receptors in our, on our, in our lungs, and um, then uh, help it get into cells. And this right here is a blow up of what, the, um, what this protein looks like. And I showed you another representation of that same protein earlier. Now, it, now the, the flu virus is changing all the time. And that's why we need a new vaccine. But there are two regions where it just doesn't change. And that's these yellow regions here, one here and one here. And so, from, as you can imagine, when we looked at this problem, we thought, well, um, how about we try and design very small proteins that block um, either this site or this site? Um, and I showed you already, and here's another cartoon, of a protein which we've designed to bind to this site, which doesn't change in the flu virus. Um, and this is uh, now, a, now this yellow here is a, really a blow up of the, um, of the, uh, of the viral sur the surface of the virus. And this magenta thing is um, the design pro one design protein, and this is another design protein. And these, these things coming off here are the amino acids um, in the design protein. And what you can see, even if you never don't know anything about biology, is that in these, the shapes of the amino acids um, coming off this, is, this design protein really fit ne very nicely into grooves in the surface of the influenza virus, like this. And all of molecular recognition in biology, almost all, is mediated by really very simple complementarity and shape between 
to proteins. Usually, in the, case, in the case of what the influenza virus is trying to do, it's trying to get into your cells, so it has, its receptor is very complementary to something that's on the surface of your cells, and they just get very close and they fit so it sticks. Here we're using the same principle of molecular recognition, but now to fight the flu virus, to make things that are very complementary in shape to its surface, so, they, so that the, basically another way of saying that is that this is a very low energy arrangement when this design protein is bound to the virus, and so it goes there and it stays there. Um, so uh, we made these proteins, we made the genes encoding these proteins, we made them in the laboratory, and we found these proteins bind very, very tightly to the virus. And this is kind of a complicated slide, but um, this is another picture of that viral protein. And in uh, purple here is uh, the design model, our computer model, of where this designed protein was supposed to bind the viral protein. And in red is the, uh, is the, is the experimentally determined. There are experimental methods for determining uh, protein structures, which are very complicated and difficult. But that, those were done with these design proteins. And what you can see is that where this protein actually binds the virus, which is shown in red, is really almost identical to where it was designed to. And that even comes down to where the shapes of these side chains are. So this computer model we made of a protein binding to the virus is, came out almost exactly right. Um, now, uh, to actually see whether um, the protein helps um, uh, prevent the flu, that's not something we can do in, in my laboratory, but fortunately at the University of Washington and in Seattle generally, there are many, many people who study, um, uh, who study um, uh, uh, the flu and other, and other things. And so, uh, we, um, and Deb Fuller's lab in the microbiology department uh, in particular does, and her graduate student Marika took this flu binding protein and showed that um, whereas when mice got uh, treated with the flu, they lost weight and nothing good happened to them after this, um, when they got the uh, flu, this flu binding protein at the same time, nothing, they, they were just totally normal. Um, and, uh, and it's kind of neat the way that she's giving them through the, uh, uh, usually drugs um, are administered by, protein drugs are administered by um, giving an injection. Turns out these proteins, since they're small, can be delivered intranasally and we're hoping ultimately by, in, by inhalation. So maybe in a few years you can go, you start feeling sick, you can go to the drugstore and inhale a little bit of one of these proteins and it will wipe out your flu virus. Um, but uh, it's not, doesn't, um, we're not quite there yet. Okay, so this basic idea of designing proteins to bind to other proteins, um, I, I, I described this case of the flu. Um, there are many other types of um, viruses and um, bacteria that um, uh, we're applying the same approach to to try and make sort of a new class of, of, of drugs that will prevent infectious disease. Um, there are also are um, other diseases like autoimmune disease and cancer where you have, where your cells go out of control and so we're designing proteins uh, which will bind to the surface of tumor cells, for example, and shut them down. Um, but since I've already given you one example of proteins that bind to proteins, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm now going to talk about something a little bit different, which is proteins that bind to small molecules. Um, so this is, a, this, is a pro this is a small molecule which is called uh, digoxygenin, which is used to treat certain types of um, heart conditions, heart disease. It has the problem, though, if you get too much of it, it can kill you. And the range between where it helps you and where it kills you is not very big. So we want to know is whether we could design a, what we try to do is design a protein which would bind to this and soak it up so that if you were a doctor and you got, and you, um, uh, you um, gave a patient too much of a drug like this, you could then uh, remedy it by, by giving them the protein, giving the patient the protein. So the process we use is very similar. Now here's this, um, this thing we're trying to bind. It's not a protein, it's this small molecule. And then the same kind of thing, we, try and we design basically uh, interactions uh, that um, the design protein here is in green. We design amino acid sequences that interact, uh, make very low energy interactions with the small molecule. And here's a small molecule and here's our design protein. And it really fits very snugly. It's kind of like a hand in a glove. So again, this is just a computer model. Um, we then make the gene that encodes this protein. We make the protein in the lab and see whether it binds the small molecule. And um, 
uh, the protein does bind the small molecule. It actually binds the protein, binds the small molecule very, very tightly. And here's again when we can, uh, when the, st when the um, structure was determined using experimental methods. That's what you see in um, cyan here. And the, the computer model, the design model, what we were trying to do was make was in magenta. And you can see the design protein is coming out right, and this small molecule is bound in pretty much the right way as well. So there are many small molecules um, which, uh, where it would be use, very useful to have high affinity binding reagents. Some of them are other drugs like apaxaban, which is a, a blood thinning reagent, which also can be lethal if you get too much. The, there are other compounds where you'd really like to be able to detect them, to know that they're there. So um, things like uh, hormones that are associated with uh, stressful conditions or, um, uh, or um, uh, one of the compounds we're trying to go make where we have binders to now is called artemisin, which is a very promising malaria, anti-malaria drug, but it turns out there's a big problem of counterfeit uh, artemisin in the world today because people sell, you know, if you're buying it, you don't know what you're getting. So we've got a protein now that binds quite tightly to artemisin. We think that could be help used to uh, validate um, uh, the, um, uh, whether what you're actually getting is the right thing. And sort of on a similar vein, Washington State has asked us to design protein which binds to THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana for obvious reasons. Um, so, um, so anyway, so there's a lot of different, both for, um, uh, for sensors and for, um, for what, what I sort of generally call therapeutic sponges, binding up toxic compounds. Also pesticides, we're design we've designed proteins which bind to uh, toxic compounds and can soak them up and detect if they're present. Um, but I won't talk any more about that since I already gave you an example, this one example. Um, the next thing I want to describe to you is the design of materials. Now you might, um, so why are we interested in materials? Well, um, some common things that you're used to, like silk and wool, are made out of proteins. Other, other things that you're familiar with, for example, the shells of oysters and abalone and clams, are made out of, um, are, and essentially all materials that, all all things that all materials that occur in nature are not made out of protein per se, but they're organized by proteins. So if we could figure out how to make, um, uh, to take the types of, you imagine all, you can think about all the sort of exotic materials you have in nature, ranging from shells to silk to elephant tusks. If you could figure out how to make those things synthetically, there you could imagine a whole new generation of types of, of materials and products we could have around us. So I'm going to tell you about how we're going about that. So in a material, um, it's not just one protein typically, it's many proteins interacting together. And so first I'm going to describe a material that's made out of, um, that's rather than a continuous thing, it's, it's a closed, um, closed cage. Um, so um, here we're taking two proteins, a green protein and a blue protein, and figuring out how to fit them together so they make this very, um, uh, this, this closed structure here. And um, again, we can find a the way we make these proteins stick together is we design a, a set of amino, we design the amino acids at the interface between the blue and the green protein so they stick together. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see this, but when we make these two proteins in bacteria and we break the bacteria open, um, what, when we look in the electron microscope, what we see are, um, this is the computer model of what we were trying to make. And what we see are these things that look like little shredded wheats. They look very, this one's actually a pinwheel more. And um, we get uh, these particles which look almost identical to what we were trying to make. And it's a little hard to see, but that's true for each of these cases. So we can design proteins that assemble together to make closed shapes. Um, and we can go further uh, using an experimental method called X-ray crystallography. We can actually determine where every atom is in these um, designed uh, uh, nanomaterials. And it turns out that uh, the atoms are nearly identical place in the actual structures as they were in the computer model. So we can make computer models of these new types of structures, and then we can come up with amino acid sequences which uh, fold up to these very precisely. And here's that. Here's the pinwheel one, the actual, the design model, and here's the crystal structure. And so we're making more fanciful ones now. This is one that's an icosahedron. It basically looks like um, a kid's jungle gym 
you know, the ones that have all the bars that go together at the top, except this is a complete icosahedron, and uh, this one also assembles into icosahedral particles when you make it. Okay, so what are we trying to do with these? This shows pictures of some of the um, materials we've made so far. Um, you could imagine a number of things, and these are the kinds of things we're working on now. Um, these are like containers. So um, uh, to treat conditions like cancer, uh, currently, um, uh, uh, as you know, people are treated with chemotherapy agents. They're, they're drugs which are very, very toxic, and you take them and they go all over your body and they kill the tumor, but they also do a lot of damage elsewhere. So we're working on ways to package inside these particles the chemotherapy agent and then put on the outside uh, proteins which bind uh, to the outside of tumor cells so the chemotherapy agent will only go where, um, uh, where uh, it's needed to go. Um, uh, another exciting possibility is these, um, I, I didn't show you what a picture, well I showed you that picture of the influenza virus but I didn't show it very precisely. What a virus looks like is sort of like one of these big cages with things sticking out. So we can make things that look like viruses and in fact have viral protein sticking out and maybe make a whole new, uh, a whole new uh, uh, type of vaccines. Currently, vaccines are just basically killed virus from last year. But um, as we learn more about the immune system, we, might be, we should be able to design, um, uh, uh, um, design particles that, are even, that elicit an even stronger immune response to the virus. And um, uh, now for layer, now this is now something which is not a closed structure, but an open structure, a, th uh, a layer. And for layers, now we're starting to think about templating um, things like abalone shell, where you could imagine a layer that then leads, leads minerals to be deposited down upon it, as well as nanowires for nanoelectronics and other related topics. I'll show you a picture of a layer in a minute. Um, so this is a protein which has been designed to, to uh, interact with other copies of itself to form um, uh, regular lattice. And when we break open, when we make the gene for this and break open the bacteria, we see that it, the protein does, in, does indeed form a regular lattice that is very similar to the design. So now we're trying to think about how to detach things to it uh, so, um, uh, so we can start making this layer do things. Okay, so I've, I'm just going to talk for about two more minutes. Um, so I mentioned already Rosetta at Home, where, where all the calculations I've described are very time, computer time intensive. And so uh, while we've tried to put computers in every available spot in the University of Washington, we kind of ran out. So that's why we needed to um, list these 350,000 volunteers. Um, but once we had it going, if you, if you participate in Rosetta at Home, um, there are there message boards and people started writing in, and I have sort of a blog there. People started writing in and um, uh, saying, well, you know, I'm watching my computer fold up the protein. You see, when you run Rosetta at home on your computer, you see a screensaver that's, that's basically like the movies I was showing you. It shows you what the computer's doing. And they would say, well, the computer keeps moving this part of the protein to the left, but it really should go to the right. Um, and can't you make it so that, um, uh, so that uh, uh, I can guide, help guide the computer so it can do a better job? And so this led to um, the idea of making sort of an interactive version of Rosetta at home. So we teamed up with the uh, people in the computer science department here and developed an interactive game called Fold It. Um, now in Fold It, it's very much like Rosetta at home. The protein, we're either designing, a, we're trying to design new proteins, but now um, the, the, the person um, can, uh, the player can help guide the computer. And so this is what uh, Fold It looks like. And again, if you just go, if you just Google Fold It, you'll get installed on your computer. And it gives you um, a set of tools, which are basically the operations I've already described, like, uh, like let the, the protein fold up. Um, but you can also go in and you can pull and push things around and fold up the protein on your own. And so good Fold It players know how to go back and forth between um, sort of moving things by using their intuition and then using uh, these various tools. Um, and uh, so this was actually an interesting one. We called, this was a protein um, which no one knew the structure of, but was a, a monkey virus protein. So we called this an unsolved monkey virus protein puzzle. And it turned out the folded players actually managed to solve, determine what the structure of this was, which was very exciting. Um, and, uh, um, and they've actually solved a number of different problems, including um, uh, designing, uh, I, I didn't talk about, one of the things we work on is designing catalysts for chemical reactions which don't currently have catalysts. A catalyst 
are, are, is something that makes a chemical reaction go faster. Um, and folded players have improved some of the designs that we've made. Um, but rather than tell you about that, I thought I'd, uh, people always ask me, well, who are these folded players? And I thought I'd let them speak for themselves. A really good folded player, I think, needs a number of skills. Problem solving is obviously one of them. I think a slightly addictive personality, um, a little bit of stubbornness thrown in, and a little bit of luck on top. You don't necessarily need to have a scientific background to play. You just need to know what works and what doesn't. And you can learn that within the game itself. I'm an administrative worker in the rehab team. I'm, I'm just answering telephones, uh, working on uh, bespoke computer programs, interacting with staff. It's very repetitive. When I go home, I become a different person. <laughs> I just like to measure myself against something. And it's given me something that my everyday life hasn't given me. It's, it's to just use abilities I didn't know I had. For me, it's a guilty pleasure. And yet, here I am involved in something that has real relevance in the scientific world. It makes you feel very proud of what you do, which is essentially a, a little hobby. He's much more professorial than I think I will ever be. So, um, so these were actually the two of the top folded players in London, which is where that video was made. And uh, so they asked us where, you know, for the names of folded players in, in London where they were making it. Okay, so I'm pretty much done. We've started, um, we started an institute for protein design at the University of Washington to try and really uh, fulfill this vision of designing proteins to address modern day problems. And um, these are the, ver the different areas that uh, we're working on, um, uh, uh, trying to make improved uh, therapeutics, both uh, improved drugs to treat infectious disease, as well as um, uh, conditions like cancer. Um, I mentioned diagnostics, detecting toxic compounds in the environment, uh, improved vaccines. Um, uh, we're working on new ways of, of, of fixing carbon dioxide and making fuels. Um, I talked a little bit about targeted drug delivery, and um, uh, um, and I mentioned uh, new materials. These are all areas that we're working on. And somewhere here, I think I have some more information on it, or you can look it up on the web if you're interested. Now, I didn't really do any of this myself. Um, I'm very lucky to be working with... Um, some really fantastic um, co-workers, uh, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. And um, I won't go through uh, everyone's name on this slide, but these are the people who did the work on the, um, on the design of the different uh, uh, proteins I described. And uh, again, I'm sorry about starting late, and uh, I'll be around for a bit if you want to, or happy to take questions now first and talk to people in person afterwards. <laughs>